I'm Effie Parks. Welcome to Once Upon a Jane, the podcast. This is a place I created for us to connect and share the stories of our not so typical lives. Raising kids who are born with rare genetic syndromes and other types of disabilities can feel pretty isolating. What I know for sure is that when we can hear the triumphs and challenges from others who get it, we can find a lot more laughter, a lot more hope, and feel a lot less alone. I believe there are some magical healing powers that can happen for all of us through sharing our stories, and I'll take all the help I can get. Once Upon a Gene is proud to be part of Bloodstream Media. Living in a family affected by rare and chronic illness can be isolating, and sometimes the best medicine is connecting to the voices of people who share your experience. This is why Bloodstream Media produces podcasts, blogs, and other forms of content for patients, families, and clinicians impacted by rare and chronic diseases. Visit bloodstreammedia.com to learn more. Hi, and thank you for spending this time with me today here at Once Upon a Gene. Two days ago on the most recent episode, I tell you all about the Global Genes Patient Advocacy Summit coming up on September 12th through the 14th, 2022. So when you're finished here, go take five minutes and hit the episode right before this one and check it out and learn about all the deets. I really hope you can join us in person or virtually. Today, I'm talking with one hardworking, dedicated mom. Three years ago, she adopted the most adorable little boy named Salim. He has a rare disease called epidermolosis bullosa, or EB for short. It causes the skin to become very fragile, and any trauma or friction to the skin causes painful blisters. It requires constant vigilance and changing of bandages and all of the things. This little boy is so joyful and beautiful and such a good little dancer, and he's he's so lucky to have this loving mama. Something unique about this story is she adopted Salim three years ago from another country. And we're talking about rare disease adoption and what inspired her to make that decision and how they're doing so far. You have to head over to Instagram also and follow their journey at Team Super Salim on Instagram. I'll link it in the show notes here. Please enjoy my conversation with Laura Deliker. Hi, Laura. Welcome to the show. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, I'm looking forward to chatting with you. You know, we joke a lot, seriously, about all of the hats that we wear, and you have a couple extra in your collection. So I do. Yeah, I'm excited to talk to you about it and learn a little bit more about your experience so far. So give me a little background. You have the cutest boy in the world. How is he so cute? I know. He is adorable. I can't handle it most days. (laughs) My son Salim is seven. He will proudly tell you seven and a half years old. And he is a lover of sarcasm and oceans and outer space. He also has two completely unrelated genetic conditions. So he is the only person in worldwide documented history that we know of, at least, to have these two conditions. His primary diagnosis I did know about because I adopted Salim from India four years ago as a single mom, and his primary diagnosis is recessive dystrophic epidermolysis bullosa, or EB, because that is a mouthful, uh, which basically means his skin does not adhere to his body. So any sort of friction causes his skin to sloth right off or to blister equivalent to a third-degree burn. So it affects him internally, externally. It's about six to eight hours of hands-on care a day, um, including a three-hour or so dressing change. It's a lot. But he is he is the bravest person I know by far. Yeah, he is. We always say that this rare disease world is the club that nobody wants to join, but you willingly joined it. You adopted little Salim knowing that he had EB. Yeah. Why? The easy answer is that... I knew I wanted to adopt a child with EB after being involved in the EB world for almost 10 years or so prior to bringing Salim home after my friend's son was born with EB. The more complicated and kind of harder to understand answer for some people is that I just, I knew that he was my son and he did not come out of me. I didn't birth him, but 
he is my son and he just happened to be born on the other side of the world. And I had to go through a few more steps and hoops and fundraise and things that people don't have to do when they have babies biologically, but he was my son. So I did what I had to do to bring him home. I think a lot of people will understand that feeling, actually, Laura. So you knew a little kiddo who already had EB, so you had been exposed to this world a little bit. Mm -hmm. And that's what inspired you to kind of look for little Salim and look in that in that rare disease world. Yes. You're also doing this as a single parent. I am. You've taken on quite a bit, Laura. Yeah. And silly me, I thought I was, you know, just in quotes, adopting a child with EB. Like that was no big deal. But here we are with EB and another genetic condition and all kinds of complications along the way. But I wouldn't change a thing about who he is or what our journey has been so far. Tell me about what the day in the life looks like. I know there's the hours of changing of the dressing. But tell us kind of what it's like from morning until night. I'm up every day before the sun rises because we have so many things to fit in in a day and so many meds and feeds to time. Thank goodness we have home health nursing that, and that he qualified for Medicaid because of his disability of EB. But of course, also home health nurses are very hard to come by these days. So it's a scramble of trying to juggle working full time and holding down a job since I am the only source of income to put food on the table and a roof over our heads while managing a kid with really complex needs. But he is able to go to school and school is his favorite place in the world. <laughs> he absolutely adores it on days when I have to pick him up for an appointment. He cries because he doesn't want to leave school. So we are very thankful for that and that even through COVID, school has remained a safe place for him. So it's just a lot of juggling. I think like all of us trying to juggle appointments and therapies and meds and tube feeds and all of that, but being the only person to do so definitely adds another layer onto things for sure. Hustling, hustling. Yeah. <laughs> the world of uh, single parenting is one thing, but the world of adding on raising a little kiddo with a couple rare diseases is there a supportive adoption community within this this niche? Is there an adoptive niche supportive community that you found? Or is it more so the greater rare disease community that you've kind of found your support and your people? There is a wonderful adoptive community. And I have a lot of friends who've adopted kids from India. And we thankfully have been able to stay in touch with some of Salim's friends from when he lived in India. But it still is also feels a little bit out of place because... There's nobody else with either one of his genetic conditions in the adoption community, let alone both of them, of course. And not very many people who have taken on such, I don't like to use the word severe needs, but I would guess maybe all-encompassing or time-consuming needs like Salim has and to the extent that his medical needs are. The rare disease community is absolutely wonderful, but I have not found a single other adoptive parent who's adopted as a single parent in the rare disease community as well. So, you know, there's a lot of amazing communities in my life, but it's also a little bit like, oh, I don't know totally where I belong because I fed a little bit here and a little bit there, but haven't really found anyone else that's kind of in the same boat as me in all aspects. It's like a cafeteria. You take some from here and you take a little from there. Yeah. Yeah, that's I can I can definitely understand how that can be pretty isolating at times for sure. That's a lot to manage. Just even the smallest bits of your life is a lot to manage, but not having maybe that one person that completely gets it. Yeah, that's got to be hard. Yeah. What about the matter of kids, right, who are adopted from places where perhaps their circumstances were extreme in some way, or there were just, you know, being a kid who's in the system, right? Like there's so much trauma that probably comes along with that. And even more so if his medical needs aren't being met and if he doesn't have access to so many other types of services for his well-being, what kind of stuff came over with little Salim in that matter? It's a lot. I mean, just the act of adoption alone is can be completely traumatizing. I mean, I was a total stranger to him who just showed up in his life one day and I spent a few hours with him there and I went back to my hotel that night and he got to sleep in what he knew as his home. And then the next day he left and he was not old enough or able to comprehend everything that was going on. And I mean, I took him to a world full of the 
top medical professionals and everything, you know, where all of his needs, needs were being met and are met to this day. But to him, I was a stranger who took him away from anything and everything he's ever known. And then when you add that on with just the circumstances that he grew up in for the first three and a half years, they, the people who cared for him did the absolute best that they could with the resources that they had, but it was a facility. It's not a home. It's not a family in the true sense of the word. Um, and there were a lot of things he missed out on and didn't have access to. And he just, he had a hard, he had a hard start in life. Um, and with that comes a lot of trauma and a lot of anxiety and just different ways that that manifests in his day-to-day -day life that we're still trying to figure out four years later, quite honestly. Sure. For, for both of you, for the whole family. Yeah. What do you think that you were not prepared for, like at all? What did you not see coming or having to having to manage so much with this experience? Like I said, I thought I was you know, just adopting a kid with EB, you know, one severe genetic condition. I did not see another one coming at all. We actually did a WES, the whole exome screening just to or sequencing to kind of rule out a few things because he was having some neurological symptoms and we never got an answer for those neurological symptoms. They're still here to this day with no answer. But this other genetic condition came out of left field. And it did explain a lot of things that were written off for a while as, oh, it's just trauma or it's just behavior or, you know, it's just because he's only been in the U.S. for X amount of years, which I think happens a lot in adoption. You know, it's hard to get a diagnosis because there's so many other things going on. So it explained a lot, but it also it took me by surprise. That's kind of like the understatement of the century, I think. What are some of the big things that impact him from that second diagnosis? That affects a lot of just the way that he interacts with the world in terms of speech and language delays, you know, processing, things like that. It also, he has a platelet disorder, which we now know of because we got that diagnosis. And of course, when you have open wounds all over your body, which he does because of EB, the two things that you need to heal wounds our collagen, which he does not produce any collagen seven because of his EB. And you need functioning platelets and his platelets don't work. So it's, it's one of the worst coexisting diagnoses I think that you could have with a disease that gives you open wounds all over your body, you know, but we're just, we're figuring it out. What supports do you wish adoptive and single for that matter, parents had more of? That's a great question. I mean, first of all, I wish that, that, that there were more of us. I wish that more of these kids who on paper have what can look like really scary and severe needs, I wish that they had homes and families because there are so many kids waiting all over the world and all over the country and in the state and city that everyone here listening to is, lives in. Um, there are kids with needs who are waiting. And... I feel like that's the number one thing that I have missed is community of people who are doing life like I am. Well, hopefully you telling your story on this podcast and it not being the last time you do so, hopefully we find others like you because this is this is such a powerful medium. And I really believe that there are probably so many adoptive parents out there who unknowingly adopted kids who have rare diseases, right? Especially when you're adopting them from other countries and you don't necessarily have all the information or there's a language barrier or maybe it's just kept private so they can adopt these kids. I bet it is way more common than we think. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that's a big deal. What about his roots as a little boy from India? How do you kind of connect that with your daily lives now? We are so lucky. We have, I think, the world's most supportive community here locally um, in our Indian community. About 20 minutes or so from our home is a really large Indian community. And they have shown up in ways that I just never would have imagined. It was actually... Our local Indian community, when we first came home, that stepped up the most, that took it upon themselves to create a sign up genius, to have everyone sign up four times to come over and help me cut his bandages and vacuum the floors and do the dishes. I mean, things that I was just, especially in the beginning, so overwhelmed by. 
and they showed up and I, I am so incredibly thankful for their love and support to this very day. Salim does Bollywood dancing. He's going to perform in June. He just performed last weekend at a camp that we went to. He absolutely adores India. He talks about it all the time. COVID threw a major wrench in our plans of going back, but we will make it back soon, hopefully sooner than later. But it's still, it's a huge part of our lives. And that's a big part of international adoption is making sure that you know, you're equipped to, to keep these kids connected to their roots because it's, it's so, it's so integral. Uh, is amazing. I love that you have that community. Where do you live, Laura? We live uh, in the Raleigh-Durham area of North Carolina. So many great things going on in North Carolina. Yeah. Yes. I love that so much. What about his skin? So I know that you're changing his bandages every day and his skin doesn't adhere to his body. Right. What is it like to even just go somewhere if you're going to be gone the whole day? Or can you even do that? How do you travel? Are there days that it's better? Like, is there stuff that helps it? Does it go through cycles of when it's really bad? We definitely go through waves. And we are unfortunately in a really rough spot right now with his skin. I can't remember. Well, I take that back. I can remember one other time in the last four years when it was as bad as it is right now. And there's really no rhyme or reason. I mean, we can Sometimes it's heat, sometimes it's sweating, sometimes it's activity level, but I think sometimes, you know, it's just life and, you know, life comes in waves and so does rare disease and symptoms flare and it's just how things go. But when I first brought Salim home, another EB mom said to me, and her son is several years older than Salim, he's a teenager now. She said to me, you know, skin wounds will heal eventually. It may take a long time, but they will heal eventually. But the emotional wounds of always being the one to sit on the sidelines, those are the wounds that will never heal. And I have made that my my parenting mantra. You know, Celine went to soccer camp over spring break and it was non-adapted, non-special needs. It was terrifying and his skin took a beating for it, but he loved it. And that's kind of what we've, That's how we roll. We do spontaneous day trips. We go out, we do things. We've done spontaneous weekend trips even. It is a lot of work. And I, you know, spontaneous, I say that, but it takes a lot of planning (laughs) still. (laughs) Trust me, I get what the spontaneous part means. Yeah. But I also, you know, try to keep things pre-packed in the car so we can do things or we can change schedules as much as we can and just really let him be a kid. Because unfortunately, life is short. And when you have his type of EB, life can be even shorter. Um, So really just trying to enjoy every second. I admire you so much for coming into it with that mindset and choosing, right? Choosing maybe the road that is hard by going out and doing things and being spontaneous and letting him be in environments that he might get hurt in, but doing it because it makes him happy, which then makes you happy. And it makes you feel a little more normal. And when you can get even a little bit of relief in something, it just has so you just get so much bang for your buck. Yeah. And it's not easy by any means. It's like (laughs) one of the most terrifying things is when I drop him off to soccer camp and see him run out there with soccer balls flying at his head and (laughs) him standing in the goal playing goalie. I mean, but I just have to remind myself of even last night he looked at me and he said, I know my skin hurts, mommy. But I had so much fun. You have to stop everything you're doing after you listen to this episode and go follow Laura on Instagram and see this beautiful, beautiful child who is always smiling from ear to ear. He's just captivating and you can see what she's talking about. It's really beautiful. Yeah, he's truly amazing. I don't know how I got so lucky. <laughs> so to anyone considering adopting a child with medical complexities, How about top three go-to pieces of wisdom that you have? Goodness. I mean, the thing I always say is these kids, they're so worth it. And they can look so terrifying on paper, you know, especially kind of in the adoption world, you literally are like handed or now these days emailed a file and it lists diagnosis after diagnosis and delay. And, and it's also the same as 
you know, when you have a child biologically, you, you never know what you're going to get. You never know what you might uncover, but it is so worth it seeing the joy that he experiences every day and just the way that it makes you, it makes you really reevaluate things and not take things for granted. It's not an easy road, but it is so incredibly worth it. And these kids are worth it and they need more than anything else. They just need love and a family. Not that it's easy. Love doesn't heal everything. Family does not solve anything. You know, by no means do I want that to be the takeaway, but, but it's worth it. As hard as it is, it's always worth it. Yeah. I think everybody knows exactly what you mean when you get to just sit there in wonder and look at these children who, no matter their circumstance, have this spark and they find the joy, right? And it just emanates. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, well, Laura, we're going to help you find more people like you. <laughs> and, and I think we just need to have this conversation more, right? Like I've only probably been contacted two times by people who have adopted kids. So it's really not a conversation that we're having in the rare disease community very often. So it's important that you're out here speaking about it because I do feel like we need to help this community band together and you know, get you the supports that you need, even if it's just on a ICU level, which is such a huge level. And I hope that this helps even one family find you. Well, and I think it's so hard in adoption too, because there can be this like stigma or this just feeling among, you know, adoptive families that like, I chose this. So I shouldn't ask for help because I knew what I was getting into, which is so easy to fall into because you know, it's, you know, comparison is so easy to fall into in general, but then you compare yourself to a family who was expecting a healthy newborn and all of a sudden life changed in the blink of an eye. And I think for adoptive families, you know, we have months, sometimes years to prepare and it feels like, you know, I, sh I should have been ready for this. I should be able to do this because I knew what I was getting into. And so it can be so much harder to reach out and to admit struggle and to ask for help. I hear you. And that's really complex and I am I imagine can be really confusing. And obviously, you know that that isn't the case, but it makes sense. And it, oh gosh, it's, it's kind of heartbreaking, right? That we're expected that just because we knew something that we're completely capable and that it's not going to hinder anything going forward. And that's just not the case for anything. Even if you did know about it from not even adopting a kid, but whatever area of your life, that doesn't mean that there's a guidebook and that there was a class you could take and that real life doesn't come into it and emotions and all of the stuff. And it is such a, it's so sad that we as humans feel like that about so many things that we should know better and that we can't ask for help. And that why would we need help? Because I asked for this when that doesn't make any realistic sense. Right. Ugh. Yeah. It's like that mind versus heart struggle. Like, you know, it, you know, you know, the truth of it, but that's still the way that it feels and kind of the heart leading the way in that. Yeah, totally. I think this needs to, you know what, Laura, maybe this is a foundation that you start. Maybe it's the parents who are raising kids with rare diseases who are adopted. This needs to be a bigger conversation and there needs to be specific supports in place, right? Like just for things like that in the mental health world. And then for, you know, figuring out ways how to keep children with their culture and, you know, growing up with certain things and all of the complicated things that are involved with raising these kids. It might be you, Laura. I know you know how to do some paperwork. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's been my biggest because I'm a clinical social worker by profession <laughs> and that has come in handy as being a rare disease mom. Oh, yeah. Sure. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, even just in our discord group, your your experience as a social worker specifically has a lot of bonus uh, in relation to like certain advice people seek. Yeah. And there's so many layers to it. Like you said, like, can we, how can we keep kids in their families of origin, which is always the best option, but then, you know, that comes down to stigma of disability and access to resources. And, you know, there's a million different things that are all rare disease related and disability related and culturally related. And, you know, and then the fear of adoption, because 
Medicaid waivers aren't available in every state. So how are people going to pay for all these medical bills? You know, there's just, there's so many pieces. It's daunting. It's daunting. Yeah. We need to figure out a way to get, to get your community more help for sure. Cause that's a big, big, big job on top of everything else. It is. Yeah. Oh my gosh, Laura. Okay. Well, you're giving me a lot of ideas which I'm going to noodle around and probably talk with you about later. But for now, I'm so glad that we got to chat and that we get to share about little Salim and some of your experience. I'm really hoping that we find some other parents like you and get the ball rolling. Yeah, absolutely. Is there anything else that you want to leave with the listeners right now, Laura? I think, you know, if you do know anyone in your life who falls into any of the kind of categories that I live in, whether it's single parenting or adoptive parenting or obviously rare disease parenting. I mean, all of those hats are so heavy and come with so many unique things, especially I think single mom parenting to, or single dad parenting as well to, to a kiddo with disabilities of any type, whether it be rare disease or not is, is really hard So check on your friends because they're not going to ask for help most likely. Mm. Amen. All right. Thanks, Laura. Thank you. I really appreciate it. I hope you've been enjoying this podcast. If you like what you hear, please share this show with your people and please make sure to rate and review it on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also head over to Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter to connect with me and stay updated on the show. If you're interested in sharing your story or if you have anything you would like to contribute, please submit it to my website at effieparks.com. Thank you so much for listening to the show and for supporting me along the way. I appreciate y'all so much. I don't know what kind of day you're having, but if you need a little pick-me-up, Ford's got you. Ha 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 ha!